All right, so in this uh, video, we're going to continue our discussion with uh, limits involving infinity and take a look at another example. Now, this one does not happen to be a rational function. A true definition of a rational function is a polynomial over a polynomial, which is not what we're dealing with in this case, seeing as we have this radical in our denominator. Um, so we're still, we still want to apply the same technique, but we're going to have to do so a little differently. I need to figure out a way how to divide everything by the highest degree to x in the denominator, uh, but I need it to be the, the correct power that will allow me to not only divide everything off that I need, but to get underneath this radical. So the easiest way to do this, uh, and we need to go nice and slow because there's going to be some things here to really pay attention to. So I've got this square root 7 plus 6x squared. I'm going to divide by the square root of x squared. And you can see how that would allow me then to combine the radicals and that x squared underneath would be then me dividing by the highest degree to x from the denominator. But we have to do it to everything. Uh, so I'm also going to have to do it up here. Now, in our denominator, uh, it simplifies down pretty nicely. Uh, that'll be a 7 over x squared plus 6 all underneath that radical. Now, in the numerator, it's a little tricky, okay? Now, I always ask, what is the square root of x squared? And 99 times out of 100, everybody says x. And you're right half the time, but the other half the time you're wrong. Uh, we know that the square root of x squared actually equals the absolute value of x. We know that because, for example, if we take the square root of negative 5 squared, which equals the square root of 25, which equals 5, our answer here is actually the absolute value of that x value, okay? So x can be positive, x can be negative, but what comes out of it will always be positive. So what's interesting to us is we want whatever comes out to be positive, right? But we also have to take into consideration that in this problem, our x's are negative. So if our x's are negative, and I just write an x right here, then I don't have my, my positive quantity that I need. So therefore, I need to put a negative out in front of it, right? So again, let me, let me kind of go through this again. I know that this quantity right here has to be positive, right? We say so right there. But I also know that when I go ahead and I drop the square in the uh, um, a square root and I get this x, that x is going to be negative because of where I'm going. So to keep this thing positive, I've got a negative, negative value. So that's going to give me my plus. Now when I do this, that's going to be a negative 2 over x plus 1. All over the same square root 7 over x squared plus 6. This would go off to 0 this would go off to zero, and my final answer now would be my one over root six. Now, had we not caught that, this negative needed to be here, our answer would have come out as negative one over root six, which would have been incorrect. Um, I would encourage you as well to graph this one on Desmos to, to better understand graphically what's happening. Um, but it's a little bit tricky, especially when you're dealing with, with these even roots like this and needing to get underneath it. Um, it's perfectly legal what we did, but we have to remember what comes out has to be positive. And if our x's are negative, we need that double negative there to create our positive quantity. Uh, so again, these radicals you have to be a little bit careful with. Okay, so for the last example um, of this section, we're going to take a look at this limit as we approach positive infinity. Now, this is one where you can't really get away with plugging stuff in. Um, even if you plug the infinity in, quote unquote, this would be sine of zero, um, which is zero. But zero times infinity is actually another indeterminate form, one of which you'll study at Calc 2. Um, so plugging that in isn't going to really work all that well. Um, instead, what we're going to do is we're actually going to do a substitution. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and let u equal 1 over x. If that's true, then it looks like u goes off to 0, right? If that's true, if u equals 1 over x and my x goes to infinity, 
1 over that really big number means that u goes off to 0. This also means that x would equal 1 over u. All right, so if I solve this thing, I multiply the x and I divide the u. So then by making this substitution, now I'm all of a sudden coming up with these uh, outcomes. So our limit would be as u goes to 0, my x is 1 over u, my sine of u now, and you can hopefully see and remember that limit as u goes to 0 of sine u over u would equal 1. And so, uh, once again, we're seeing the, these outcomes here um, using not only new techniques, but old techniques as well. Um, these limits at infinity are pretty interesting. Uh, I'm a big fan of graphing these things after working them. Um, they're, they're so easy to see visually, unlike some of the others that are holes or small points. Um, generally speaking, these things really level off hard um, at the, the value you come up with. So, again, throw this into Desmos to convince yourself um, that uh, you, what you have is correct. Uh, but this is a, a general u sub on a, a limit. Um, they're common. I can't say that they're incredibly common, but it's a nice workaround um, depending on what type of function you're given.